So, I am going to talk to you about the American Revolution and some of the thinkers that motivated not only the revolution, but the creation of what we know as American government. Um, so we are all New Englanders here, and most likely we have some idea of what happened with the American Revolution, because a good portion of what kick-started it happened in our backyard, and that could be quite literal for some of you that live in the Concord, Lexington area. You may think of Paul Revere or Sam Adams and the Boston Tea Party, and we're not going to really talk about that, but it's important to note that Division 2 AH, you will spend a year on America looking at the creation of the Constitution specifically and a whole bunch of other great stuff. So don't worry if you think this might be the only time you get to see American Revolution and American government, because it's not. So now I'm going to try to explain the American Revolution in a few minutes, and also some of the founding fathers or the framers of American government. Uh, here we go. So following what is known as the Seven Years' War, or otherwise known as the French Indian War, England was in debt from fighting the French over control of what we know as the American colonies. Great Britain was victorious, but now needed to pay for the services, boats, weapons, and anything else that was paid for to secure the American colonies. Well, Great Britain, finding that the colonies should have to burden some of the load, decided to raise certain taxes on the colonists, and told American colonists that they could no longer trade with other countries like France, who England had just fought to control all these money-making colonies. Uh, the idea was, hey, we just saved your butts, you now need to pull some weight uh, to make sure the motherland doesn't go bankrupt. And this was kind of reasonable, maybe you'd think, but a lot of colonists did not think so, because a good portion of the wealthy, successful colonists happened to be merchants, and heavily relied on importing and exporting with other countries. There was also the idea of representation, and this was truly lacking for the colonists. In England's constitutional monarchy, Parliament had representatives all over England to represent people's interests and concerns. The American colonists did not have representation in, in English Parliament. They had some say what happened in the colonies, but they didn't really, they did not have representatives over in England, like, sharing their ideas in Parliament. So this becomes a massive concern for the colonists as the, the tension builds as we approach American Revolution. So as you know, the 13 colonies did unite and fight Great Britain for complete autonomy over what becomes the United States of America. This, of course, is not an easy task, and we could spend a whole semester or even a year talking about some of the amazing aspects of the war that led to creation of the U.S. Constitution and our, our U.S. Uh, government. But for our unit on the development of Western thought, we just want to take a look at like people that were involved with this major historical event. So we're going to look at this through our lens of the development of Western thought, not as American history students. And like I said before, the people who really desired independence from Great Britain were these well-to-do colonists that were businessmen, merchants, bankers, lawyers, and they all felt that their success and way of life in the colonies was at stake by what's going on late in the 18th century. So why should they follow the laws and pay taxes to a country way across the Atlantic Ocean when their success had been a result of what they do in the colonies? So most of these men were well aware of political philosophies that had been going around in Western Europe, and the idea of representations and rights would become major influence on how they would prefer their homeland to be run. So, a major figure during this period was someone known as Benjamin Franklin. You probably know him. Uh, Franklin was actually born in Boston to a working-class family and attended high school here in Boston before he ran away to Philadelphia at age 17. There he found success in the printing business and actually bought the Pennsylvania Gazette in 1729. In the 1750s, Franklin got more involved with politics and would actually represent Pennsylvania's interest over in England over like who would be governing or running the Pennsylvania colony. Uh, in 1765, this is the beginning of the major tensions between the U.S. colonies, or the American colonies, and England, uh, because England passed what is known as the Stamp Act, which infuriated a lot of colonists. This meant that every single piece of paper used in the colonies had a tax on it, and... <laughs> To represent that you paid your tax, you'd have this stamp. And this means that literally every single piece of paper, so like even in newspapers, 
you would get taxed for every piece. Uh, Franklin, who had started out as a royalist, begins to start thinking, hey, yeah, maybe we really should start separating ourselves from this this empire because this is starting to get a little ridiculous. Uh, Franklin felt that the tension between Great Britain should end its separation, and he really saw that England's reliance on the colonies to pay for the debt of the French Indian War was a little unrealistic, and he argued that the colonists provided some of the the same amount of troops that Great Britain did to fight the French Indian War, or Seven Years' War, and they also paid a good chunk of the finances needed to fund that war. Uh, during this period, Franklin also saw a lot of corruption in the way that English, England ruled the colonies, and really becomes an active fighter for American independence from really the 1760s and on. Uh, things really start escalating in the 1770s, and in 1773, we have what we know as the Boston Tea Party, and after this, Great Britain really ups the stakes on how they're going to control the colonists. They launched these things called the Intolerable Acts, which were a direct response to the dumping of British tea into the Boston Harbor by the Sons of Liberty, who were led by Sam Adams. These acts closed down Boston Harbor and Harbor. mandated that all government representatives be appointed by the British royal governor. They allowed Great Britain representatives to be tried for anything considered illegal by the colonists in England. So if you were tried for something, you would have to go to England and be tried rather than in the, uh, the colonies. And uh, the Intolerable X also demanded that colonists house British soldiers for free. And <laughs> this is when people really start getting ticked off. Uh, colonists everywhere were citing injustice based on the denial of representation and also this unfair punishment on behalf of Boston. It was a violation of what people were starting to call natural rights, an idea that had begun to grow in the colonies. As tensions rose, Franklin used his printing background to publish newspapers and flyers containing messages such as this one. Uh, using visual imagery along with strong models was an effective means to which these great thinkers could spread their ideas to those people that may not have seen the value in separating from Great Britain. In Virginia in 1776, someone else was also utilizing the idea of the printing press, uh, and this was Thomas Paine who printed what is known as Common Sense. This pamphlet explained why Paine believed that Great Britain had no right to tax the colonies if they were not being represented in English Parliament. The famous saying he coined, no taxation without representation. Common sense was mass-produced for colon colonial times, and at least 100,000 um, copies of this pamphlet were sold in just 1776, which is a big deal for colonial times. Uh, printing became a major tool for those in favor of independence. And they were very persuasive and necessary if they were going to gain support for independence. Uh, tension had been rising for a while before 1776. And between 1774 and 1776, skirmishes had already begun to take in place. Um, before Common Sense was even written, the battles of Lexington and Concord had already happened. And um, the Minutemen, or the Massachusetts like infantry, had already risen up and helped George Washington actually kick out British troops from Boston Harbor. <coughs> Eventually, all this excitement around independence let the colonists convene with their best minds in what was known as the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia in the summer of 1776. Franklin was elected to be on the subcommittee to draft the Declaration of Independence. The person charged to write the draft was Thomas Jefferson. So Jefferson was a Virginian lawyer and had studied Enlightenment political philosophy as a law student and believed strongly in the idea of human rights and the government's obligation to protect them. This may sound very familiar. In the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson presented Americans as a self-governing people committed to the principles of liberty and equality in the face of British tyranny. All men are created equal, created equal Jefferson wrote. And the importance of this ideal necessitated that a people advance from that subordination in which they have hitherto remained in order to institute new government. So in other words, <clears throat> they should rise from this tyrannical government and institute their own government. Jefferson declared America as independent because Great Britain was not meeting the needs and requirements that Americans rightfully deserved. 
Again, this should sound really familiar to you. The reason this document is groundbreaking is, <clears throat> well, you see, people can theorize all they want, but to actually separate from a sovereign is a pretty radical idea. The men meeting at the Second Continental Congress were risking their own lives to try out a new political idea. Keep that in mind that this had been just an idea prior to writing of this document, and these colonies just decided not only will they separate from Great Britain rule, but they will also build a country based on relatively new principles that have never been tried out before on a whole country. It's pretty insanely cool. Uh, another major player in this campaign for independence was another Massachusetts man named John Adams. And uh, Adams was a lawyer and a cousin of Sam Adams, the guy that led the famous Tea, Potter, Tea Party and is now more known as the <laughs> influence for the modern-day Boston Beer Company. Like Thomas Jefferson, Adams felt that as the country moved into a need for independence, the Founding Fathers must begin to already think of how a future nation should operate. The new free men must aim for a <clears throat> the best political arrangement possible by drawing on British Enlightenment thinkers like John Locke. Pur purpose of government is to be found in the goal of happiness. Such happiness lies not merely in ease, comfort, and security, but in virtue. In devising a government that secures such happy, happiness for many, a republican government should think, feel, reason, and act like the people at large. So the government should be a reflection of what people are asking for, what they need. The success of the American Revolution is something that is still up to debate. There were outside help from France that helped a lot later in the war, something Great Britain just couldn't win a war all the way across an ocean. Um, some people say that the revolution is purely due to American fervor for ideals and ideas about governance, and some say it was a combination of a lot of luck that a bunch of farmers and merchants were able to seal independence from the greatest empire in the world at the time. Uh, overall, the success of the U.S. independence was a combination of a lot of factors, most of the drive behind the desire to fight really does land at the feet of some of these amazing American thinkers. Franklin is remembered as a scientist, a writer, a philosopher, a politician, and a businessman. And he was not simply taking Enlightenment ideas, for he was really using an analytic, synthetic approach to a lot of different fields of study. And he is a real example of an American Enlightenment thinker. Uh, Thomas Jefferson Adams went on to be immensely important in, in writing of the U.S. Constitution in the governance of America after the Revolution. And they also both happened to be presidents, one after another. Um, these two American thinkers took a massive chance when they supported independence, and they borrowed largely from the ideas that they learned about from our philosophical friends over in Europe. So these are just a few of the men who influenced 13 colonies that it is worth fighting a superpower something intangible called rights. Well, thank you for listening. Uh, there's one more video in, on this section of American and Revolution, which you should watch right after this, and it hopefully is posted right below. Have a good night.